So Troy, you're like basically an MC. I didn't really know much about the program, but like now that I know why he's running this, 
Welcome to the conclusion ceremony of the summer program on nuclear disarmament education by the Soka Institute for Global Solutions, or as we call it, SIGS. My name is Vicky Loch. I am a student at Soka, soon to be sophomore, and I come from Estonia. And I am a student research assistant of SIGS. It is my pleasure to be your MC for today. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and thank you for joining the live stream as well over there yeah so for the past five days 16 young people participated in our program they came from nine universities from three states california colorado and missouri missouri yeah all the participants went through extensive discussions to explore effective and sustainable actions towards nuclear disarmament and abolition. We are delighted to host this conclusion ceremony where you can hear from the participants themselves how the summer program went. First, let me invite SIGS Managing Director, Professor Tetsushi Ogata, to share welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. And thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. And thank you to those of uh, people watching online through live stream. I'm the managing director of SIGS. It is with great joy to introduce the participants of the SIGS summer program, Nuclear Politics 2023. I'm excited to invite all of you to this space today where our participants care, can share with you the ideas that they generated for their action plans. Their action plans are what they promise to do as an individual or as a group. From now on, starting from tonight or maybe tomorrow morning, starting from tomorrow morning, they will engage in their action plans. This year's Nuclear Politics 2023 is an inaugural project for SIGS. Our institute was born only one year ago. SUA President Dr. Ed Fiesel announced the launch in May 2022, saying we will create a space where a network of global citizens can gather together and seek to solve global problems together. SIGS was established based on a concrete proposal by our university founder, Mr. Daisaku Ikeda, in his 1987 peace proposal to the United Nations. Since the Institute's launch, we established two working groups. The first one on global citizenship education for K through 12, and the second one on the nuclear evolution. Our Institute is focusing on these two projects, global citizenship education and nuclear evolution because they are what the founder, Mr. Ikeda, has been dedicating his lifelong work. I'm really grateful that SUA President Ed Fiesel and SIGS Executive Advisor, Andrea Bartoli, have been meeting with me and Yuya Uchida, our institute coordinator, every month. President Fiesel and Dr. Bartoli have been closely involved in every step, every step of our institute's development. Also, another word of appreciation goes to SIGS Senior Research Fellow, Alexander Haran, who has been advising our nuclear evolution project from the start. To move the projects forward, we created two working groups, uh, each for global citizenship education and nuclear evolution, and these working group members are from SUA alumni. I am pleased to share that we have three working group members, Maya Ono, SUA Class of 2011, Josie Porthouse, SUA Class of 2014, and Komichi Sakakibara from Class of 2021. 
we have been meeting regularly over the past year to make this summer program happen. So thank you very much for your continuous involvement and support in this program. Thank you so much. I'm also pleased to share that this year's summer program was made possible in collaboration with Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey and its Center for Non-Polarization Studies, or CNS. We are fortunate to invite four speakers from the CNS. They greatly enriched our discussions in the program. Our thanks go to all the four speakers. And we had a tremendous fortune to receive 16 wonderful young people from nine universities. Let me share the names of the universities that they represent in alphabetical order. Chapman University, King's College London, University of California, Arbonne, University of Denver, University of Southern California, Santa Monica College, and our own Soka University of America, Truman State University, and Whittier College. I want to thank each and every single one of you for choosing to participate in our summer program. They chose to learn about nuclear disarmament. They chose to explore a world free of nuclear weapons. They chose to take action. They chose to come here. I believe that their choice represents the value of Soka University of America. And it has been a pleasure of SIGS to provide them with the learning opportunities. I'm excited to stay engaged in our network of cooperation after the program ends. I'm excited to invite all of you back to our network in the future programs next year, three years from now, five years, 10 years from now, into the future. Let us grow this network together. Thank you so much, everybody. Now we have the pleasure to invite three program participants who will share their thoughts on the program. Let's welcome Troy Haddadi, Trinity Huynh, and Garrett Welch. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Garrett. Um, and on behalf of all the participants, I want to express our profound gratitude for the opportunity to participate in this program. Um, I know that I speak for each and every one of us um, when I say that we've each thoroughly enjoyed the program and walk away from this program with significantly deeper knowledge on what is, in my view, one of the most crucial issues facing humanity, um, and that is the issue of nuclear weapons. Um, so I'm going to begin by providing a brief overview of the program to provide context for the presentation of our final project. On day one, we began the program by participating in introductory sessions in which we got to know each other and share about our personal backgrounds and prior connections to nuclear disarmament. Later, we had the privilege of listening to Jean Dupre, Senior Program Manager for Education Training at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies, CNS, deliver a lecture on the facts and background uh, related to nuclear weapons. Additionally, Maya Ono, one of our working group members, led a session in which we engaged in the humanitarian and philosophical underpinnings of nuclear abolition. On day two, Gabe Boldizar, Vicky Locke, and Marine, Mar Marina Onin, our student research fellows, presented on the historical experiences from the Cold War, and Koichi Sakakibara led a discussion on the historical precedence of nuclear danger. That afternoon, Jose pa Josie Parkhouse, Another one of our working group members presided over two sessions in which we discussed the international architectures for nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation, including both the opportunities and the challenges inherent within these existing structures. For the third day, we had the great privilege of being visited by Masako Toki, Senior Education Project Manager and Research Associate for CNS, as she delivered a lecture on the International Initiative in Nuclear Disarmament and the TPNW. Masako generously participated in all of days three and four of our program, offering her invaluable insights to our various discussions. Later, Trisha, Trisha White, a graduate of the CNS program with a master's in nonproliferation and terrorism studies, delivered a lecture on current proliferation challenges, specifically engaging, examining case studies of North Korea and Iran. That afternoon, Tetsushi Ogata, managing director of SIGS, led her lecture on the nuclear risk reduction strategies and we engaged in a group discussion about the strengths and weaknesses of these various strategies. 
For the fourth day, Sarah Bidgood, director of the Eurasian Nonproliferation Program at CNS, delivered a lecture on U.S.-Russia arms control uh, overview. Following this, we spent the rest of the day conducting a nuclear disarmament negotiation simulation exercise in which we sought to develop a, co a, co a statement on disarmament acting on behalf of the Aliso Viejo City Council. Finally, today, day five, we worked on integrating all of the knowledge and insights that we gained from the previous four days into a final group project. The objective of this group project, which we will present about in detail here today, is to develop an action plan for the future in which each of us can engage in a sustained manner toward the realization of a world without nuclear weapons. Um, now, Trinity is uh, going to give a few special thanks uh, to those that made all of this possible. I hope everyone's well this fine afternoon. On behalf of all of the participants, uh, we would like to thank a couple people, a couple individuals uh, for making this possible. We would like to thank um, Andrea Bartoli, Tetsushi, Yuya, and Dr. Ed Fiesel for um, leading this initiative to create this program. Uh, we would like to thank the experts from the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies um, for providing a wonderful, wonderful lectures on nonproliferation and nuclear disarmament. And then we would also like to thank uh, working group members, Maya, Josie, and Koichi in the leading of some powerful discussions and um, teaching us more and educating us more on nuclear issues. And then of course, our student research fellows, Gabe, Shinsaku, Marina, and Vicky for all of their work they worked really hard on this program throughout the entire week. Uh, they spent nights up till late, late hours just to um, find solutions to the next the next day's uh, organization schedule. And so, yeah, we would like to thank all of those people, those individuals who played a significant factor in this year's Soka Institute for Global Solutions Nuclear Politics 2023 program. And then of course, we would like to thank our distinguished guests on Zoom and here in person for coming to hear our presentations on and solutions on uh, non-proliferation and nuclear disarmament. Thank you so much, Trinity and Garrett. I am very excited to kick off the first of our group projects, uh, which is about a pro-disarmament magazine presented by Marsha Humphreys from Truman State University in Kirksville, Missouri, Sage McCarty, a peace studies and political science major at, from Chapman University, and two UC Irvine students who just finished their fourth years and will graduate very soon, Elias Ortega and Berenice Ramirez. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Elias Ortega. I'm a fourth year political science major at the University of California, Irvine, as Troy mentioned. One amazing quote that has acted as the basis for this project is to be realistic, demand the impossible. These words rang true in May 1968, and they ring true today, June 2023. That is why myself, those around me, and, our, and the participants of this program have committed to the creation of a magazine. This magazine will be titled Words Not War, and we hope to be able to release the magazine bi-weekly with the first issue being released by the end of August this year. Our collective aspiration would be to have six issues released and physically available by the time we we're able to reconvene in June 2024. This magazine, will, this magazine will be able to encapsulate various aspects of the conversations, such as the research various students have committed to embark on, such as Berenice, and uh, the visual art aspects, such as the mural idea Marsha has committed to, Poetry Sage has, has committed to creating and will share. Inclusions such as interviews and pieces from the in inspiring speakers Soka University so graciously, um, so graciously connected us with. This magazine will act as the way for all members of this program to be able to stay connected one year, five years, 10 years down the line. To create a medium to be able to share what we have to create a medium to be able to share what we have uh, we have learned through this program will we'll serve as the gift we give back to Sofia University. 
Um, as individuals, and even more so as a collective, we have a responsibility to contribute, educate, and inspire the world around us for the cause of nuclear abolition. Let our aspirations reach far and wide and let us create the foundations towards a world free of nuclear bombs. Remember, be realistic, demand the impossible. Thank you. Class Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing uh, fine today. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to come and hear us out. Um, my name is Berenice. I am so incredibly privileged. Um, I feel so privileged to be here speaking to all of you. I feel so privileged to have been able to spend the last couple of days um, among such great minds, peers. Um, I have learned so much. I've had so much fun. I've been challenged in many ways that I did not expect. But most of all, I have been inspired um, by all of my peers and um, all of the wonderful um, people who contributed to this program. And um, yeah, so my commitment to, um, to the contribution of the Words Not Wars uh, magazine is based on my personal idea of um, a research project that will not only seek to eventually in the future, hopefully be published in um, a scholarly journal, but also to reach the general public. Um, because it is my belief that nuclear disarmament is an issue that affects all of us and should be accessible knowledge to everybody, not just uh, the few of us who are privileged to occupy these spaces. Um, therefore, um, it is my project will try to reach um, in a bilateral way, not only advocate for <laughs> nuclear disarmament in academic circles, but hopefully also within the general public through accessible um, language. I will also remain committed to um, remain as engaged as possible with um, all of the new friends that I have been able to meet and uh, all of the friendships that I have been able to create through this program. Uh, thank you so much for hearing me out, for accompanying us uh, here today. Uh, I really appreciate you. Hello, um, my name is Sage and I'm from Chapman University. And I wanted to start off by um, thanking everyone for this opportunity and thanking all of the people who have contributed to the development of this program, um, especially in ensuring that it has gone so amazingly well as it has. Um, I wanted to start off by talking about the contribution of that art can play when it comes to the subject of nuclear politics. So during my time in this program, the part that stood out to me most was about how um, art can emphasize that nuclear weapons pose a threat to humanity, especially through the destruction that's caused and the most inspirational parts were especially these artistic portrayals of the impacts of nuclear weapons, especially through film and through physical art, especially the art created by Hibaksha. Um, I am mostly a poet nowadays. I do physical art also, um, but I wanted to talk about how my poetry specifically will be included in this magazine. So the targeted audience for this poem and for poems that I hope to write in the future, um, although I am presenting now to this group, the targeted audience will eventually be university students and the general public through this magazine's publication. Um, the targeted impact of this project is a very personal and empathetic impact where I want to reach people's emotions on the subject to really emphasize um, that we need to have empathy for people who are affected and will be affected by nuclear weapons and the threat of nuclear weapons. I was especially inspired by a artistic portrayal of people's experiences during the 2018 false missile alert in Hawaii. Um, where the fear experienced by people in Hawaii during that time really showed the personal impact that nuclear weapons have on people's everyday lives and personal relationships. Um, so although I will be personally responsible for this poem and ones that I will write in the future, I hope to involve people within this program and within uh, the campuses represented by the people at this program in future creative endeavors related to this magazine. So. Um, I, I hope that others will want to contribute creatively, and I hope to 
improve access to be able to contribute creatively. So um, this poem I wrote during my time at this program, um, and I intend to, to contribute other creative work in the future. Um, I also want to acknowledge that when it comes to these long-term projects, there can be setbacks, especially when we want to continue this uh, one, five, 10 years into the future. So I think that art poses a gateway for people to enter the conversation of nuclear politics and to engage in inspiration because of the focus on creativity. So creativity provides an outlet that may be more accessible than research or other academic means. Um, and even though all of us will graduate from our universities, and I do think that if we want to contribute creatively, that creative aspect can be something that we contribute or continue far beyond our college years, because everyone will continue being creative during their lives after college. Um, I also wanted to link this to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, for example, of ensuring um, education that is lifelong and promoting peaceful and inclusive societies. So if we focus on educating people throughout their lives on the topic of empathy and inspiration, people will want to engage in politics or nuclear politics, even though it is such a impactful subject at times, even though it is pretty upsetting to talk about at times. But I think that if we approach this from a creative aspect, people will feel an empathy that they can bring not just to the field of nuclear politics, but throughout their lives and within their communities in a way that helps to foster positive peace. So the poem that I wrote is titled Fallout, and it's focused on the effects that nuclear weapons and false alerts and the threat of nuclear weapons can have on people's personal lives. So I wanted to share this poem with you. The tantrum of the opera fills my mind. A cadence shrieking pierces with no rhyme, like demons crying just outside my door, like something I have never heard before. The break in silence shoots the people out beyond their doors to find the source of sound. But sirens say so little that's about a place to hide where fallout won't be found. They tell me war is hell, behold a horse, but no one can prepare for hell on earth for winter dark and cold and brought by man. And where to hide, the sun becomes morose, outshined by stars embedded in our hearth. For at that point, we cannot hide or stand. Thank you. That was an amazing poem. Thank you for sharing that. Hello everybody, my name is Marsha Humphreys and I'm from Truman State University, all the way in Missouri. Um, so I wanted to share an idea with you that I had for a mural. Um, I is This mural idea is the culmination of the past five days. When I first came into this space, I had zero idea what I was getting myself into. Um, nuclear politics, like it seems so, so passionate. So like there's, there's, it seems a little bit like a, a, a trigger word almost. <laughs> it seems so far from what I, as a business and psychology major, would dive into. But I'm really, really glad to have come here um, and to have met all these amazing, amazing people. Um, so the idea for the mural is a look back through history. So it would be a timeline from left to right, not necessarily year by year or anything like that. Just um, we are a very violent species, and um, the the idea of the mural would be we start looking at um, at when we were just cavemen fighting each other with sticks and stones. Then it would progressively from left to right. You'd be able to see how our technology has advanced and how we've become even more efficient at killing each other. And then we'd get up to the modern day and we'd see um, modern uh, artillery, modern weapons. And then there would be this blurred out spot. We're not exactly sure what, what that holds because that's a little bit in the future. 
But then on the far right, the final image would be peace. Peace. I had read something written um, that said, said, sorry, I'm getting emotional, <laughs> that uh, in a world with nuclear weapons, we cannot have war. We cannot afford to have war. We have to rely on, and so because of that, because we have the potential to destroy humanity very quickly, we have to rely on diplomacy. We have to rely on peaceful, peaceful ways of resolving conflict. Conflict is never going to go away, but we have to rely on ways to not destroy each other when we fight. <laughs> so the theme of the title of the mural would be called Not a Dream, a Future. Thank you so much. I cannot wait to get the first batch of magazines. Um, coming up is our second group, which has conceived a website to create a hub of information on nuclear disarmament and nuclear education. It will be presented by Trinity Quinn, who is a political science major devoted to the human rights movement, as well as learning about international relations, Anna Palmer, a UC Irvine student who just finished her birth, fourth year, Camila Salas, a rising sophomore at USC, Garrett Welch, who is pursuing the master's degree in international human rights at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies in the University of Denver, and myself. Hi again, I'm Trinity. I am a political science major with a peace studies minor at Chapman University. And as a political science major and peace studies minor, we learn a lot about history. We learn about a lot about humanitarian intervention, humanitarian aid, um, ways we can combat situations and human rights issues. But a lot of times this information and education isn't accessible to other people in different fields and just regular people interested. And so what we are hoping to do is create a website that is a hub for information um, comprised of education as well as um, different resources, students and people, regular people um, can access. So first, there will be a couple parts that um, other people will talk about, but I'll talk a little bit about the education aspect and advocacy, uh, ad advocacy aspect. So with the education portion, um, we hope to gather educational resources on this one platform, such as resources for presentations, slides, and course syllabi for teachers and students to um, read and look at. So, for example, professors will be able to, um, to have a template for future course material. And then for, uh, like, other examples would be videos, uh, videos and other educational tools, um, as well as advocacy education tools, because a lot of people don't know how to advocate and they want to advocate for nuclear disarmament and nuclear abolition. So some of these advocacy tools would include social media toolkits, um, how to lobby and reach out to legislators, how to safely protest and advocate, because that's a huge issue in the advocacy space, and then drafting priorities and support letters. I think through building a website like this, we can make it more accessible, as well as it could be a hub for people sharing information and um, getting educated. So, yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Anna Palmer. I am a fourth year at UCI and I'm about to graduate. And today I wanted to thank you so much for being here and giving me the opportunity to speak to you. 
um, about this topic. And I think we're all here because we all want to see a safer world and eliminate the possibility of the effect that nuclear weapons have on humanity and also study the art of healing. I also wanted to speak on um, what I thought for the website would be very good is having more mental health resources, but are specifically focused on the PTSD and trauma that mental um, that nuclear weapons can have on a society, especially um, former testing sites, the PTSD that's still on a lot of survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I don't think that you need to have a nuclear weapon drop on you to be affected by this and heal from the trauma of wanting to have a safer society. So I was thinking that we could have a forum on the website, um, a platform where we can have resources, try to build each other and create a more humanistic education that um, values human life and also the mental health aspect of it. And um, I think we can begin the healing process now rather than later. And because um, also a lot of things with nuclear weapons and the trauma still from World War II is very evident today. Um, there's a lot of hate still. And I think it would also be really neat to utilize the opportunity of possibly having a panel and inviting survivors of the atrocities of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, as well as former veterans to come together and try to heal from the trauma of what's happened and extend that to our community. We want to fix de-incentivize de information. We want to break barriers and also try to analyze what happened from both sides and make sure this is never repeated again. I think it's also important that we value the relations between Japan and the United States. You know, they have a very good alliance now. Make sure that no matter what's happened in the past, that we only move forward now, which also goes to the educational part that my colleague Trinity was saying about possibly creating more study abroad programs between Japan and the United States, the fact that they can visit the Hiroshima Memorial, but also visit Pearl Harbor and Hawaii and just um, work on forming this alliance and hoping that this never happens again. And then I also wanted to just end with this quote um, that I think could strengthen this right now, which is that peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding by Albert Einstein. And I think these are the right steps we can do. And especially as someone who works in data science, I think it would be very effective to appeal to a younger community um, through a website and make it very accessible so people know where to go and spread the change that we want to see in the world. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Camilla Salas, and I am a rising sophomore at the University of Southern California. Uh, first off, I want to thank everyone who is able to be present here in person um, and those watching virtually as well. Um, I think I really applaud you all for taking the time to uh, listen in on a subject as, uh, as powerful and as passionate as uh, my colleague mentioned before, as nuclear politics. Um, but I think it's really important that we focus on... Um, I really think that it's important that we focus on this issue now. Uh, over these past few days, I've learned that this issue is very intersectional. And I honestly came into this program very pessimistic. Uh, and I think a lot of people in my generation can agree that we've become very desensitized to issues that threaten us, um, be it uh, school shootings or uh, threats against LGBTQ people, ban on books, uh, whatever it may be. And I have to say that after this program, I have uh, really uh, restored my sense of humanity and it has been enriched uh, with the stories of my colleagues and of uh, the people who have taught us these past few days. Um, so my project proposal for this website that my um, colleagues have mentioned before is for the start of a campaign for the upcoming US election. Um, as we know, with every election cycle, a lot of young people research topics that are most dear to them, and um, that determines who they vote for for president. Uh, and I think it one of the most important issues that should be at the top of presidential uh, candidates' agendas. Um, and as we know, the U.S. has many pressing issues, but I do believe that this issue of nuclear weapons encompasses all those issues. Uh, a powerful quote that was shared with us during uh, these past few days was a quote by Dr. King when he was fighting for integration during the civil rights movement. And he said, in order for there to be integration, there needs to be a world to integrate. Um, so therefore, I think that this this should be uh, an issue that we're all talking about. Uh, and I'm, I was very surprised over these past few days how little our youth knows 
about our military spending and uh, what exactly goes into our nuclear program. Um, my project is a campaign led by young people to demand those running for president in the 2024 election to take action on the threat that is the existence of nuclear weapons. Um, the threat of nuclear war is an issue that should be at the forefront of any presidential candidate because it is not only an intersectional issue that includes other matters such as climate change, food insecurity, economic disparities, uh, taxes, and more, but it involves our very humanity and not just those of Americans, but those of the whole world. Uh, it is in our right to fight for our right to live. Uh, and the threat of nuclear war and the continual inaction by the US president and the exec executive branch directly opposes that. No matter which party or which ideology, red or blue, this campaign will offer you the way to let Biden and other candidates know that they care about denuclearization uh, and how the military budget is spent. This campaign aims to engage young people through multiple outlets, whether it be a petition, social media activism, or public statements through the press. Um, and this campaign will state uh, that the time is now for the safety of the American people and for the 47th president uh, to lead that example of peace for the world. Um, uh, thank you so much for your time. All right, hello again. Uh, like I said, my name is Garrett. Um, I'm currently pursuing my master's degree in international human rights uh, from the Joseph Corbell School at the University of Denver. Um, and so my contribution to this project is a, a co-campaign. Um, and it's a, a campaign centered around uh, dialogue. Uh, SUA finder uh, Daisaku Ikeda uh, consistently in all of his writings emphasizes the importance of dialogue and sowing the seeds of peace throughout the world. Um, in that sense, um, I personally feel that dialogue is a more, uh, is a more potent weapon uh, than even the most dangerous nuclear weapons. And so uh, in that uh, light, I, uh, I would like to propose um, as part of this website uh, a dialogue campaign. And one of the reasons that I think dialogue is so powerful is because it's accessible to everybody. Um, it does not require uh, any effort other than literally just having you know, a conversation with another human being. Uh, but at the same time, dialogue requires courage, especially to speak on an issue such as this, an issue that many people find to be inaccessible, um, that they find to be intimidating. Um, but at the same time, the only way to uh, garner a grassroots uh, coalition of people that are dedicated, that truly understand um, the threat that nuclear weapons pose to humanity, um, I really believe that dialogue has to be a cornerstone uh, of, that, of that process. Um, and so what I envision for this website uh, is to have a, a page on the website that is a map. And anybody can go onto this map and uh, whenever you engage in some kind of a conversation with somebody else uh, regarding nuclear weapons and humanitarian consequences, uh, you can uh, you add a, a tick to each to wherever you uh, wherever you had that conversation. Um, and so, since this is a you know a, a network of people that are engaged globally, um, the, my goal is that this can provide a concrete uh, metric to really see the, the seeds that we're sowing, because they're not necessarily always going to sprout right away, um, but to have like a concrete quantitative metric to show that, you know, that, that we're making efforts, it helps hold us accountable, it allows us to set goals, concrete goals toward the future, um, and also uh, you know, serves as a means of, of you know, sharing the content on the website itself. Um, as you know, everyone has, has shared, the, you know, the goal of the website is to be accessible, for the content to be readily available to anybody that reads it. And so by engaging in dialogue, you know, hey, we have this website. Um, you know, if you want to learn more about it, you can check it out. And then maybe that person engages in dialogue. And these effects, they multiply. Um, and I strongly believe, you know, it's my personal conviction um, that a dialogue campaign of this sort has the potential to really fundamentally transform uh, the conversation around nuclear weapons, the conversation around nuclear deterrence, um, and, you know, help the people of the world develop a vision for security that's not dominated by mutual fear um, and mutual distrust, um, but is instead, uh, you know, built on a foundation of, of fundamental trust. Um, and I feel that Dialogue has the power to do that. So that's my initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, a big factor in regards to nuclear politics for me is how exclusive it can come off. Uh, there are many nuances and moving parts between countries and cultures, 
And if you are not given the chance to receive a formal education in the topic, it can be intimidating. That is why I would like to contribute a questions and answers section to the website where those who are unfamiliar with nuclear politics can find a series of common misconceptions and concerns that appear in everyday life. Being able to access an approachable source of information will prepare them to dive into the wealth of knowledge that is in the website. Um, I thank you for coming to our, our presentation. And now we will invite those who have developed individual final projects to the stage. Let's welcome Noel Kai, a war studies major who is very well read in nuclear politics. Ken Shintaku, a recent USUA graduate who will be pursuing a master's in education at Harvard University. Inez Logan, a fantastic student from Whittier College. And Amy Kuroda, who just graduated from SUA. Hi everyone, I'm Noel, as Troy introduced me, I'm pursuing a bachelor's in war studies at, with the Department of War Studies in King's College London. So at the end of this program, I'll probably be the furthest away from everyone here in this room. So my project was based on, was surrounding an idea of an academic research paper, because as Troy mentioned, I've had some previous experience in this field, as well as in international security. And what I did find was that there's not significant overlap between the different departments in the government. So one of the issues um, that was difficult to breach was that when civil society tries to approach issues like nuclear disarmament to official government bodies, such as the political sphere or the military sphere, they don't necessarily address it in the same from the same perspective. I hope that by performing some research written specifically in from the realist perspective, I'd be able to engage more directly with people from the military or political sphere and address their security concerns in a way that would also meet our nuclear disarmament goals. I'm not sure what extent this research will look like, but I hope to have this not only completed by next year, but published as well, so I could return next year to this program and share what people have responded to my work. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Ken. I'm originally from Hokkaido, Japan. I just graduated from Seoul University of America and I'm pursuing master's in education at Harvard Graduate, Graduate School of Education. A song of victory resounds in my heart. The power of spring rises in my soul. This is the world by the Ukrainian poet, Lesha Ukrainka, that SUA founder Daisaku Ikeda once shared with young people. Tomorrow will mark the 27th anniversary of Mr. Ikeda's Columbia Teachers College address entitled Thoughts on Education for Global Citizenship in 1996. Today, humanity faces serious challenges such as the threat of unemployment due to information technology revolution and widening division and differences among people and cultures due to the polarization of national spheres of influence caused by conflicts and other factors. By 2030, I believe we can overcome these challenges through the realization of global citizenship education on a global scale. Global citizenship education is an education that empowers people, especially youth, to change the world for the better, while at the same time enabling them to create value by transcending differences in nations, cultures, values, and so on. This curriculum encourages people to interact, understand, and collaborate with each other as global citizens and fosters perspectives and qualities that can contribute to eliminating conflicts and absurdities that infect the world. Instead of the state-led reforms of, of the past, empowered youth will be taking the initiative in education reforms. Youth will be taking action to deepen mutual understanding and narrow the dis distance between countries of the world through friendship and activities on a global scale. In the world, empowered youth will take action on leadership, take on leadership roles in various areas of the world and promote solutions to global issues in a significant way. Peace education and education for sustainable development, uh, de excuse me, development as part of the global citizenship education curriculum will create a decisive trend toward global nuclear abolition and put an end to environmental destruction and climate change. By next June, I will develop a draft of K through 12 global citizenship education curricula and specific recommendations for policy and global youth and educator networks to implement and sustain the curricula. What kind of world do we want to create and see in a nuclear free world. I believe we can create a world where children can travel the world in hot air balloons with hope and joy and spread friendship around the world without worrying about borders, 
and missile dangers. A world where we can eat, we can we care about each other's happiness instead of other nations' weapons and bring compassion, not violence, to the ends of the world. And a world where we talk about how great the potential and dignity of every single human being is, instead of how powerful a single bank is. What can we accomplish if we redirect the money being spent on the nuclear arms race to humanitarian purposes? I believe that we can achieve a world where every child has access to the best education, a world where we can confidently leave a better world to our children and future generations, and a world where leaders of all nations are talking about how to build a more peaceful society together as best friends instead of fighting each other forever. Thank you. I'd like to thank Ken for being such a, a bright spot in this program, um, but I'd also like to thank everyone else in this program for being such wonderful like, people. Um, yeah, so, um, so, all right, so um, when I was in high school, um, I go, I go to, a, I, go, I live in California, I go to a California high school, and they, have, they usually have a program called 15, every 15 minutes. And this program, um, in this program, the, it was funded and developed by the California Highway Patrol, to raise awareness to the, I guess the um, the the fact that I, I guess or I'm not sure it might be closer to 30 minutes in actuality, but every 15 minutes under the premise every 15 minutes that um, somebody would die um, from a drunk driving accident. So the way they um, they raised awareness or for us, um, this was done by um, actually staging a uh, car crash using like a scrap car and calling like um, emergency response teams and uh, having a kind of production where a few students were selected to die, um, or at least like act like they were dead. Uh, <laughs> and then, so yeah, um, so the entire school came out to see it and um, pretty much um, if, uh, even if um, teenagers uh, being teenagers were thinking that it was kind of silly to watch like a Grim, Re Grim Reaper like walk everyone down uh, the street, it's in silence. Um, they still um, took those uh, the children that died away. They actually um, they actually in some cases they actually called their parents and said like they actually got the police to call their parents and say that they actually had died. Um, but we didn't go that far in my school. But they were gone for a day or two. And even if no matter what like that somebody would feel about this um, this program or like no matter what their opinion was on that, they were facing the reality that. Um, that a member of their own was gone from their classroom and like no matter um, how much they can try to pretend like it's um, that it's like or at least try to reassure themselves that it's real it makes them think about what if somebody had actually died what if they actually died um, we actually um, had like tombstone cardboard tombstones cut out um, and placed for the people that were gone so um, so yeah so this and how is connecting to um, I guess nuclear advocacy and like, or not advocacy, but like advocacy of non-proliferation and um, and uh, and I guess peace um, operations. Um, how this uh, connects to it is that um, uh, as a, a a dual major in uh, English and computer science with an emphasis in physics, um, it's uh, it's I have decided to develop an educational program uh, that would be done over multiple days that took a lot, uh, takes a lot of influence from this while um, correcting some of the things that may, where it may fall short. Um, and so in this program, um, uh, I guess I always had a um, very soft spot for simulations of, um, of real events or things that ask you, what if you were in this position? In this, uh, in this program, um, these students would be educated for a few days on, on, on the history of nuclear weapons and the Cold War. And then eventually um, starting to um, have a sort of reenactment and then as the days go by, um, I guess there's, there would be a sort of feeling that, or the teacher would have to like kind of like maybe make a point of saying that like, pretending as if there was increasing tensions or, or that the tensions were going to increase or something. And then at the point, there's a breaking point um, as the penultimate part of the program that would um, in, and I guess in the words of us, like uh, dream big or yeah, dream and possibly um, be realistic um, in an impossible scenario. Cause, um, cause like, you know, money, um, let's see, I guess, yeah, the, um, in an ideal scenario, we'd have a full on like motion simulator, um, 
experience or something like something akin to um, earthquake simulators or um, IMAX like 4D like theaters that spray air at you or change the temperature in the room to um, to kind of simulate um, what it would be like to be um, and it wouldn't even be what it would be like it would be so much worse um, but the experience of witnessing a nuclear blast and then sectioning off these students into a fallout shelter for a period of um, maybe one to three days. And that is also a very, a very generous, um, like, I guess, I estimate, I guess it, it's, um, in reality, it would take at least um, 14 days before you could go outside without um, having fear of contamination. And that's without the idea that you would get, um, that there's no retaliatory attacks or anything that are no secondary bombs or anything. That's the best case scenario. Um, so yeah, these students would be in the shelter. I'm um, experiencing what it would be like for someone to have to survive in this shelter, not knowing whether it's day or night, not having any access to electricity or loved ones, running water, um, any food that's not cans or pre like, I guess, um, like dry. Um, and I guess in that case, like it, it, as they emerge from the program, they would have both an understanding of the safety aspect, because a lot of people don't know that the safety aspect of a, in a nuclear weapon, or like in the nuclear attack, that the safety, uh, the safety protocols, um, a lot of older people were taught during the Cold War to duck and cover, and a lot of them have stories about being forced to go under their desks, and those have endured as a, um, as a, I guess, a kind of a legacy of, um, of I guess, emergency preparedness drills. And so as they emerge from this program, that's automatically, they might came out, I guess, a, a, with at least like a change perspective because they're glad it's fictional, but it's not entirely fictional because the threat is still out there. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, so regardless of whether this takes place in like um, full on Universal Studios, Hollywood level production, or just something that I do in the basement of my college with a few people that sign up for it. Um, I believe that this is a program that, this, that it's a necessary program to insert people into the scenario themselves because in a lot of cases, people do not think that they are susceptible to, I guess, feel like the idea that they can suffer the effects of a nuclear weapon. Um, and a lot of them don't know what to do. Um, there's no fallout shelters in Aliso Viejo. Despite being um, close to Camp Pendleton, the military base, which could easily be a likely target. Um, but yeah, just the idea of preparedness and the idea that um, I guess that um, if you insert yourself into something, you will at least come out of it having a new, like, I think, having time to reflect and having time to, um, I guess, want to change something so that. This isn't something anyone ever has to go through ever again. So, um, so yeah, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is Amy Kuroda. I just got in from SUA, and I feel so fortunate to be here. Um, I would like to share one personal commitment to this topic and then also one collective commitment, which we discussed earlier this, um, today. Um, one is I was really, um, throughout this program, I was really reflecting on, you know, whether I'm really taking full responsibility for this issue. And it's because it's so big. And but I was like, well, now that I, now, now that I learned, um, I was like, I really want to take responsibility for this issue. Not just, you know, temporarily. No, not, not like I, I just learned for these five days, but I really want to continue this commitment of my life. And, and I remember, uh, or I worked on my senior capsule um, on no free seat of nuclear weapons. Uh, and it's basically, I argued about how it's important that country declares this policy, which is, um, so basically country declaring that they're not gonna initiate a uh, launch of nuclear weapon. And, you know, given there's so many risks of nuclear weapon use right now, um, I argue that it's so important. And, but throughout this program, I also learned that I have to make a choice of whether I want to advance this policy or not. And um, it's not like you know, this policy will naturally take place. So I really felt like as a, um, personally, I really want to commit myself to somehow 
uh, revise my capstone, and so I'm happy about to share this with public, whether that's um, you know opinion page and news article or or journal. Uh, we we'll be able to share this work with others uh, by the end of this year. And um, as a collective commitment, uh, as you can see, we have um, really been able to create this amazing friendship. And um, through the program, we also learned how personal connections are so powerful. And actually, the discussions among the policymakers, personal connections actually do play a role in understanding each other, despite the, the crisis and how, ten how intense the uh, situation is. And, I have to suggest that we are, although we are coming back next year, but um, we're having this uh, catch up call in December this year um, to really um, also acknowledge our everyone's efforts towards this cause and, but also, you know, also maintain this friendship, but also strengthen, strengthening the ties. And, um, and you know, life is tough and we might, we may even lose our motivations for this cause. And I really hope that this catch up call will inspire each other um, to, to really um, come back, this determination that we were able to make this uh, throughout this program, and um, yeah, and then really continue this friendship, and then also as a you know, very first class of uh, SIGS summer program, I think we have a responsibility of creating, you know, taking this responsibility and then creating this network uh, of youth. So yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for really insightful projects. I can see everyone's initiatives reflecting the values of um, global citizenship. And now we're going to open up the floor for um, any questions from the audience. And please raise your hand if you would like to ask any questions to our participant. Yeah. It can be about the program or about um, like their projects. Yeah. I have a question. So I really liked um, the comment about dialogue, but I question the idea that you can come into dialogue with absolutely no preparation. So for those of you who have participated in the program, what do you think it was essential to have that training or like the knowledge gap and how can you help people who don't have that about nuclear weapons some people have no familiarity to like it truly advance the conversation yeah um so speaking for myself i came into this program with no knowledge of um Nuclear abolition, I didn't realize it was something that people were actively working towards. But um, I think the most pivotal thing and the most important thing we can project onto the world is to kind of just go into these conversations more open-minded. And the, the job of ourselves now as academics and people who have gone through this program is to take the existing literature on nuclear abolition and make it so it's more accessible, more easily um, understood by um, by basically everyone. And I think something we do need to understand, and maybe we do miss this point, is the, the country reads at a seventh to eighth grade level. I think, which is not a bad thing, it is not, it's more indicative of a failing education system. And I think when we understand that, um, we can build a basis on conversation. And um, I think we, sort of make it more difficult than it needs to be. We can we can get so many people on board with the idea of, hey, your your state leaders are almost using you as leverage, almost like, hey, we can kill this amount of people and then they can kill this amount of people. Most people reject that reality. And I think when we understand that, we can create change. Yeah, thank you. To go off on that, because like you said, most people don't really know about nuclear disarmament and uh, nuclear issues itself. It's probably, it's the, the best thing to do is to solve it at the root cause, 
which is why education is so important. And a, a lot of people don't know um, what solutions there are, especially as citizens of the U.S. and just normal people. People don't know, oh, like, uh, um, you can call policymakers or you can just have conversations with others who don't know about the issues, if you do know about the issues. And just say, oh, hey, like, um, do you know the impacts of a nuclear attack? Do you, are you aware of like issues around the world and how the US plays in foreign policy? Or like, oh, like Sage, um, wh what are you doing today? Oh, I'm, go I'm going to like a conference. Oh, what conference are you going to? Oh, I'm going to like a nuclear politics conference. Or I'm going to give a speak to my school um, at a club session on uh, nuclear education. And so like, I think there's, it's easy to have that dialogue and just bring up the question of any question on nuclear issues, which will spark dialogue and get people interested in the situation. And then from there on, people will be interested in doing research. And so like, I, I think the main thing is to try. And even if you don't know the topic or you're not too familiar with the topic, you can speak with others and either find solutions and uh, get educated for, through like the internet or uh, through programs like this. Um, you'll be able to uh, advocate for uh, the future of the world. Just to add also um, to what my two uh, peers have already mentioned, uh, Elias was <clears throat> mentioning, I think they both alluded to this idea of accessibility. I think oftentimes, especially when we talk about our own personal impact in the world, it can feel, we can feel so powerless. Um, it feels oftentimes, me as a citizen individual, uh, it could feel, at least for me, and I think this is the case for a lot of people, we feel like we have no real say in what actually happens in politics. And one of the things I don't think people um, realize is that nuclear uh, weapons are currently affecting a lot of different communities. They are an issue that are having a real impact. It's not just um, a thought about the future or the past or the previous impact that nuclear bombs have caused, but the simple development, for example, of nuclear weapons are impacting a lot of communities at the moment, right? The mining of uranium, what is that doing to our water sources? What is that doing to our land? What is What does that mean for the environment? I think that if we can look at nuclear weapons, not necessarily as um, a global, not just as a global political issue, but also as a human rights issue, as, as an issue that actually has an effect on communities, it becomes a lot more accessible because the communities that are being affected right now, they don't have an option but to fight. They can't ignore the problem. And um, I believe if we're able to not only make the language accessible, but also the understanding that these are things that are having a real impact today, right now, um, then it becomes um, a problem that doesn't just, it's not just hypothetical in the future, but it feels a lot more close to us. Um, so I don't know if that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys, if it's okay, um, let's um, move on to the reflections part because we're running a bit short on time. Um, yeah, so um, we will invite each participant to share their reflections and experience. And yeah, so the floor is yours. So anyone who would like to. Hello again, my name is Elias. I've prepared some words on my reflection. Um, so my experience at the SOCA Nuclear Politics 2023 Summer Program has been nothing short of incredible. 
I came into this program, as I mentioned, with no prior knowledge of nuclear disarmament nor abolition. I was unaware that so many amazing individuals and collectives were aspiring towards a reality free of nuclear weapons, aspiring towards a safer world. I believe that to be realistic was to believe that nuclear abolition was impossible. This program, however, has offered me an alternative. These amazing individu individuals I embarked on this journey with have inspired me, and in some way, shape, or form, I hope I have inspired you guys as well. Not only has my attitude towards nuclear abolition changed, but I myself as a person have changed. I'm more confident, more eager, and ready to pursue nuclear abolition together with you all. My hope of leaving this program now is that these projects we have so passionately presented can be built and nurtured together. Let us collaborate with one another. Let's utilize the now global connections we have built through this program, but let's also hold ourselves accountable to the action plans we have promised everyone watching here today. Let's give meaning to our words, but more than this, let us remain connected as friends. Friends who now have a universal aspiration to a better, safer, and peaceful world. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah, I'm gonna echo all of the words of my uh, of my peers in saying that uh, I found the program to be uh, deeply enriching. Um, nuclear disarmament is my primary focus in my studies, um, and it's what I intend to dedicate my my life to. Um, and so, you know, I was able to, you know, I think for me there were two uh, the two biggest things that I got out of this uh, out of the session were um, you know, the incredible lectures from the experts um, at CNS. Uh, these lectures were incredibly insightful and uh, I learned uh, so much um, about you know, aspects of nuclear politics that I haven't um, studied in my personal life to date. Um, and it also kind of you know, got me interested in potentially maybe trying to work for them someday uh, if I'm lucky. And uh, so that I think was my first big takeaway. Um, and the second I would say is definitely the fact that, you know, all of us as participants um, come from a very diverse set of backgrounds, both, both personally um, and educationally. And, you know, I've engaged in other disarmament spaces before, and, you know, there's, you know, a, a lot of circular talk that tends to go on uh, in, those, uh, in those circles sometimes. I love those circles, don't get me wrong, but, um, I think that, you know, this experience was very unique because, you know, people came in with all varying levels of uh, understanding and prior knowledge of nuclear politics and, um, you know, different uh, levels of, of knowledge on you know, international relations and politics in general, and also people that just don't, that, that are not currently studying politics at all. And to be able to engage with people from such a diverse set of backgrounds, you know, they, you know, people brought up uh, perspectives that uh, I have not encountered in my uh, in my research and in my studies previously, um, and I think without if it weren't for this program, I, I don't think I ever would have encountered those those perspectives. And so I found you know these dialogues to be uh, deeply enriching, um, and I think that that's one of the things you know that makes this uh, this SIGS program um, so unique um, and special. And I hope that it continues for many more years. Anyone else? Jane? <laughs> it's going to be a small message. <laughs> Throughout the program, like uh, Garrett and Elias said, uh, everyone gave their own perspectives on what they thought nu nuclear issues were and what they had previously learned. And what we touched on in this program was, or what what I took out of this program is hope. Uh, we talked a lot about hope and how our generation, because we've been so desensitized, we don't see a future, or a good future at least, with all the school shootings every other day and terrorist attacks and so many other human, human rights issues. Everyone initially coming in was very pessimistic and at the end of this, we're coming out very optimistic about the future, and now we're driven to uh, combat nuclear issues and make the world a better place. I'm 
want to thank everyone for this program. I actually feel really honored to have been here in my final week in the United States before I leave. The time was just perfect. But in terms of timing, I also want to, I wouldn't want to understate the relevance of this program. The world right now is facing deteriorating international security. And for the first time in many years, nuclear arsenals as a global whole have increased. We are at a point where this topic needs to be talked more in every circle, in every level of society amongst everyone available. And while I did have prior knowledge before coming to this program, mostly from the background of my degree and other spaces I've been in, in regards to international security, I found the content they presented to be very clear, very informative, and easily accessible. I'm sure my peers here who do not come from a security-related background were able to talk about how they were able to understand the content despite having no <coughs> previous knowledge of it. So to that end, I think this program has been very well designed and something that should continue to exist. At least I hope I get to come back again. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm gonna try not to cry this time. I'm pretty confident that I will not. Um, so I'm from Palmyra, Missouri. And uh, the reason I came to this program is um, I heard about it from my friend who's an international student from Nepal at Truman State University. And she heard from her friend who attends here that this program was happening. And I was like, ooh, it's free. <laughs> so I had no previous interest in um, nucle nuclear weapons or uh, politics, really. Um, but I decided. I'm gonna be. I know I'm gonna be vacationing in California for um, this like two weeks during the summer. So let's see if I can coordinate that to align with this program. And so fortunately, it worked out. Um, unfortunately, I got in. <laughs> so um, so I came in not really thinking that um, I would be able to contribute to this. Um, everybody else on I looked at the list of people who were attending and. Almost everybody else was a political science major or an international um, relations major. And I'm a business and psychology double major. And so I was like, ah, I don't know what I'm going to be able to say around these people. Like, I hope they don't think I'm stupid. Um, but uh, something that they taught me is that, um, like, I come from a, a family where politics is not really supposed to be discussed in public. Um, it's something that is kind of... <laughs> Um, kind of seen as um, inflammatory, and you're not supposed to uh, to do such a thing. Um, but this group of people um, has taught me that it's possible to engage in, pub in public um, with politics and still remain friends. Even if we do have uh, disagreements about things, we still are able to come at it from um, a perspective of trying to better the human condition. Um, also, I realized that there are two uh, think, uh, ways that I'm connected to the issues of um, nuclear politics without realizing it. Um, one is that I live really, really close to Quincy, Illinois, which is the birthplace of Paul Tibbetts, who is the man who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. And the second is that I attend a university named after Harry Truman, who is the man who ordered the dropping of bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, so this, I was so unaware that these, that this, that we were so connected, that I was so connected to this issue. Um, and this, um, these five days have really taught me a lot and I am excited to continue to learn about this topic and, um, yeah, I'm just really glad to have been here. So. Yeah, so let's move on. Ta -da. So thank you for sharing your honest and inspiring words. Next, I would like to introduce um, the president of Soak University of America, Dr. Ed Beasel to share his remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I really want to thank the participants of the Nuclear Politics 2023 program. 
Uh, what an amazing presentation of your ideas and all the work that you've done, both the two collective projects and the individual projects. So let's give them a big round of applause again for the amazing work. I think it, um, what you've all accomplished is well beyond what our expectations and for this to be the inaugural uh, program that the SIGS uh, sponsors, I just want to thank you for taking the time, the time to come and spend almost a week here uh, with each other, meeting each other, but also just you know, really launching the SIGS summer conferences projects in such a meaningful way. I think you'll see you know, five, 10 years from now, there'll probably be dozens of these conferences going on every summer on all kinds of topics that are you know, problems confronting humanity. Uh, but this is the, the most appropriate topic for our first conference. Um, you know, um, I also want to thank those who work very hard behind the scenes to make this conference a success. Our student, um, our student uh, re research, uh, uh, researcher, what is the title? <laughs> okay, it's, you know, research assistants and also the uh, working group members and the CNS experts who came and gave such wonderful uh, talks to you all in our own um, SIGS staff, Tatsushi Yuya, and of course our executive advisor, Andrea Bartolo. Thank you very much for all your efforts. <laughs> so, you know, this is so appropriate, this topic for, for our university. Um, even though we're just a little over 20 years old, the, the tradition of SOCA goes over, back over a century. Actually, it goes back to our, the founder of uh, SOCA education. His name is Suna Saburo Makaguchi. He was an elementary school teacher and elementary uh, school principal, and he actually was in prison during the war. And um, he spent almost 500 days in prison and actually died in jail. Um, he was branded a thought criminal. He was um, uh, basically you know, standing up for religious freedom in opposition to the war, and he refused to kind of give in. And so you know, he uh, created this amazing legacy for, for Soka. And um, our university founder, Daisaku Ikeda, shared, you know, SOCA means to create value. But he said, you know, simply, simply put, SOCA means the ability to find meaning, to enhance one's own existence, and to contribute to the well-being of others under any circumstances. And so that's the definition of, of SOCA. And then this, you know, the tradition of SOCA and nuclear abolition also has a long tradition. Uh, Mr. Makaguchi's student, protege, Jose Toda, also went to jail uh, in, during World War II. But he survived and he was released from prison. And then he was able to kind of reconstruct this organization that Mr. Makaguchi had founded, the Soka Gata, which is a value creation society, a lay Buddhist group. And in 1957, based on you know, his experience and the experience of the citizens of Japan, he made this amazing uh, declaration against you know, uh, nuclear weapons, calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons. And he really, really called it the greatest evil confronting humanity. And it was because it threatened the lives of individuals. And it, each individual has this unviolable right to life. And so nuclear weapons, in that sense, was the greatest threat, you know, he said, to humanity. And his student, Mr. Ikeda, uh, his disciple, really took that to heed and throughout his life has made efforts to you know, try to uh, work for the abolition of nuclear weapons. And in 1983, um, he started submitting annual peace proposals to the Secretary General of the United Nations. And in each one of those, over the years, every year, he's made concrete proposals about uh, the abolition uh, of nuclear weapons and nuclear war, uh, weapons you know, deterrent. And so it's, it's ingrained in, in, in our SOCA tradition. And in 1987, in the, the peace proposal that Tetsushi had mentioned, Mr. Kate had talked about, that was a year our predecessor campus, SULA, opened in uh, Calabasas. He called for the establishment someday of the SOCA Institute of Global Solutions. Well, last year, we, will we were finally able to establish it after 35 years and now have this inaugural you know, summer conference. So again, thank you for your, your participation. Um, in 2001, we were established, SUA, and Mr. Ikeda gave us the beautiful mission to foster global citizens who lead a contributive life. And he shared that the three qualities of a global citizen are uh, courage, not to deny difference, but to learn from difference. Each one of us come from different backgrounds. We have different identities, but really encourages us not to deny those identities, but to learn from each other. And then to develop, um, to have this... Um, wisdom to realize that we're all interconnected and our actions affect each other's lives. 
And then also this compassion to develop an imaginative empathy to, um, to feel someone's suffering is like it's our own. And so these are really kind of an ethic, a value that really fills the culture here, you know, at, at SUA. And so a global citizen is really someone who works for their community. And so um, it creates value in their community, local community, national community, and global community. And of course, nuclear weapons is something that affects our global you know, uh, community. And so again, I think this is so appropriate in that sense that we launched the SIGS summer conferences with this topic of nuclear uh, uh, abolition of nuclear weapons. I was thinking, you know, in our short history, though, we have links with two amazing global citizens who were uh, activists against uh, uh, nuclear weapons and uh, called for the abolition of nuclear weapons. The first was his name was Sir Joseph Rockblatt, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995 for his efforts uh, for nuclear abolition. And he was awarded it with the, the Nobel Peace Prize together with the Pugwash Conference on science and uh, world affairs. And he was a co-founder of that. Um, Sir Joseph Roplatt, in 2001, we opened. Our students arrived in August. One month later, we had September 11th. And one month later, Sir Joseph Roplatt, at the age of 93, traveled from London to come here and deliver a lecture to our students. And he gave this uh, a, a gift, which was a, a, a reprinted special volume of the Einstein, Russell, Russell Einstein Manifesto. That's really one of our treasures today. And in speaking to our students, he shared with them, he said, there's this Roman uh, dictum that if you want peace, he said, they said, prepare for war. But he proposed that we change it. If you want peace, then prepare for peace. And I think that's what we're doing here. We're making causes and efforts to prepare for peace and to educate people, you know, for peace. So I think he'd be very happy about this. You know, um, Sir Joseph Rockblatt, he was once asked uh, after, you know, he was getting old, aren't you going to write your memoirs? And he said, there's too much work to be done. You know, and he, you could just sense his sense of hope, as I think someone was mentioning it. <laughs> And so that hope is what kept them going, you know, to the age of 97 every day fighting, you know, for peace. And the other person that we're linked to um, who is a great um, champion of abolition of nuclear weapons was the person that this building is named after, Linus Pauling. And Linus Pauling was the only person to have two unshared Nobel Prizes. And so in 1955, he won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. And then in 1962, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts for the abolition of nuclear weapons. At the end, after World War II and after the dropping of two atomic bombs, uh, his wife, Ava Helen, and Linus Pauling became strong advocates for the abolition of nuclear weapons. He was branded a communist. He was um, voted by the board of trustees at Caltech that he had to resign his position as chair of chemistry and chemical engineering, but he never backed down. And then in 1962, there was a, a declaration on the moratorium against uh, testing of nuclear weapons. And then he was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize for all his, award, uh, his efforts. And then later, um, <clears throat> uh, they actually declared formally that they would uh, stop nuclear uh, testing uh, by the US and uh, the Soviets. Uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev announced that. Um, but one lesson I learned from Linus Pauling I wanted to share with you is actually a personal lesson. Um, in 1993, when I was a graduate student at Berkeley, um, I was taking my classes as usual, and I got a call from uh, Mr. Keda's secretaries, and they said, you know, um, Linus Pauling and Mr. Keda, they're conducting a dialogue. And so he's at Stanford, but he's going to travel down to Calabasas to have the dialogue and then travel back. And they said, but we need someone to drive him to the airport and you know, drop him off there and then pick him up afterwards, you know, and would you do that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to find this one. So the next morning, I'm driving with a friend, you know, a colleague, and we go to Stanford. And as we come to, you know, his apartment where he's staying at Stanford, he's waiting outside on the stairs. And I go up there, and he has a suitcase with him. And I know he's just going for a day. I'm wondering why does he have a suitcase? And so I go, you know, Dr. Paul, here, let me get your suitcase. And I pick it up, and it feels really light, you know. And I, I put it in the trunk, and we're driving to the airport. And I said, you know, Dr. Pauling, you know, your, your suitcase feels really light. And he says, yeah, it's empty. 
He said, I said, okay. He said, you know, every time I meet with Mr. Ikeda, he gives me all these gifts and I can't carry them. So now, now I'm going to bring this suitcase, you know. Anyway, they, he goes, he has this amazing, you know, dialogue and he comes back and, and you know, he looks really, you know, like rosy cheeked and like he had a great encounter. And we're driving back and my colleague asked Dr. Pong, you know, I'm Dr. Pong, you know, do you have any regrets in life? And he was quiet and he didn't say anything, you know. And about a minute, two minutes passes, and I think, oh my goodness, we just upset Dr. Paul. Like our, our job was to just drive him back and forth, right? But then he said, you know, actually, I do have regret. He said, you know, there was a time I was working on a problem in chem chemistry, and he said, I couldn't solve it. And I was working hard, and I was trying my best, but I just got frustrated. And he said, I put it aside. And he said, 10 years later, I was working on another problem, and it inspired me to go back to the original problem. And he said, this time I worked on it and I actually solved it. And it became one of my most important papers. And he says, my regret was I didn't solve it 10 years earlier. I just didn't work hard enough. I didn't think hard enough and stick to it, you know. And so therein lies the greatness of the person, I felt, you know, that perseverance to not give up. And so when I think about, you know, your efforts and the efforts of these great peacemakers, that hope and perseverance are so crucial in the work that we, we do. So I hope that, you know, you carry those with you. And I look forward with great anticipation as the inaugural participants of the SIGS conference to what you create in your futures as alumni of the, of the program. And I hope you keep coming back and sharing uh, with future uh, participants. But again, thank you for your participation this time. Thank you. Um, thank you so much <laughs> for these words. Um, it was really inspiring. And um, now we have like a surprising gift for everyone. And I would like to invite all the program participants to come up on stage to receive their certificate. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna do like name by name. Yeah. So it's okay. We'll call your name. That's <laughs> who you want to share with. It. So it is our pleasure to have this certificate of completion, uh, completion of the first program of SIGS, uh, Nuclear Politics 2023. Let me read out loud the certificate. It looks like this. Certificate of completion. Soka University of America proudly recognizes Elias Artiaga for successfully completing the summer program at the Soka Institute for Global Solutions, Nuclear Politics 2023, issued on the 12th of June, 2023. The next person, Troy Hadadi. Marsha Humphreys. Trinity Wynn. Thank you. Noel Ang. Amy Kuroda. Ines Logan. Sage McCarthy. Anna Palmer. Berenice Ramirez. Camila Salas. Kentaro Shintaku. And 
Derek Welch. Okay, now that you all have your certificates, um, let's take a group photo. So everyone, you can come down here and let's take a photo. Yeah. yeah. and working group members and everyone involved also come down here, please. For the participants, again, congratulations on completing the session. And uh, just two quick announcements. 